Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. And today uh, we begin a new period, um, period five. Wow, we're, we're halfway through all our periods uh, of APUSH now. We're the, at the halfway point. Uh, so period five uh, is from the years 18. 44 to 1865, or is it, eight, no, 1844 to 1877. Man, I, <laughs> I cannot get my years correct. That's two chapters in a row. Um, <clears throat> eight, yeah, it's uh, 18, oh, where is it? 1844 to 1877. 1844 to 1877. Yes, yes. Okay. So let me uh, share my screen. So this is basically the chapters that kind of have to do with the Civil War, um, the Mexican-American War, then the Civil War. Uh, so the impending crisis. Yes, they're talking about the Civil War. Um, now, you may notice I didn't. I did not say in the in the previous lecture notes that had blue background. Um, so I'm gonna say here. This is a bright blue turquoise, and bright blue combats with the red that I would originally write. Have you write down things in? So um, the thing, the the topics and sentences you need to write down for this lecture are going to be in this yellow. I mean, please still title this The Impending Crisis, Chapter 13. But just know uh, what is down in yellow, you need to write. Okay? Okay. Cool. Let's move on. Let's talk about the time period before the Civil War. Chapter 13, The Impending Crisis. All right. So looking westward, as... More and more people are going out west. There's this belief, this uh, notion of manifest destiny, and that is American settlers' God-given right to expand from sea to shining sea, from coast to coast. It is ours, and it is our God-given right to expand, and we will do so with whatever we can to gain that land. Man, I'm just rhyming right now. Okay, and it was coined by newspaper editor John O'Sullivan. The opponents to expansion were some Whigs and, of course, our guy Henry Clay, uh, which they feared tensions would boil over slavery. Uh, and there's this big, uh, big idea, big idea, big, big event in Texas where Texas actually declared their independence from, yes, you guessed, Mexico, not the United States, because they were part of the Mexican Empire, the former Spanish Empire. Now they declared their independence in 1836, and they were basically, basically their own country for about nine years, nine years or so. Um, and at the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, that's where uh, General Santa Ana signed the treaty recognizing Texas's independence and, and statehood. And um, later on, he's going to go back on his word. Um, Presidents Jackson and Van Buren were hesitant to annex Texas. Remember, annex is to add, uh, gobble up. Remember when I described annex last year in his world history? It's like hungry, hungry hippos. Gobble up. All the land you can annex. And they didn't want to annex Texas because they had a fear of war breaking out with Mexico, and that would only um, exacerbate, make worse uh, the sectional strife problems that were going on uh, in America. And this is a very famous uh, painting. You need to know uh, this is an angel. Liberty going out west, 
the lands that she touches kind of have light and they're going into the darkness, into the mountains. And she is hoping to reveal the greatness. Uh, and as you see, you have Native Americans fleeing and you have uh, people and trains coming out west. Okay. So uh, hunting buffalo. All right, uh, continuing on, Oregon. Uh, the Oregon Territory uh, was shared joint occupation with Britain. There was this uh, demand that uh, Americans go to war with Britain. They called it 5440 or fight. The 54 degree lines uh, were the extension of the territory um, up in, above into what is now present day Canada. Uh, west coast of Canada, and they wanted to go all the way up there and fight. They eventually will settle uh, on the 49th parallel line being the official border between uh, now Canada and the U.S. So who migrated west? The prosperous and wealthy young people, because you kind of need money to go out west, and that's why people moved out west. They wanted to make money, as this is all the land they could ever wish to grab and own, it was out west, okay? In a way that many of the people made it to the official west coast, whether Washington, Oregon, or California, you went via the Oregon Trail. And natives along this Oregon Trail are gonna play a key role in guiding individuals uh, through the Rocky Mountains and out to the west coast. Uh, and what you believe it or not, most people walked, okay, because you know, sometimes those wagons are gonna break down, your horses are gonna die and starve through cold, brutal winters, snowstorms, rainstorm, all that jazz. Okay, so this is the 5440 line. As you can see, this is a very far, the extreme US claim. So, right here, 42 to the 54 and in between they settled at the 49th, okay? And you know, Vancouver is right, is somewhere up in here, okay? So, hey you know. And there was this area that they were disputing. I think that's, is that the Puget Sound? And here's a map of the Oregon Trail, okay, cool. Uh, expansion and war. Uh, the annexation of Texas was a key issue on the election of 1844. You have James K. Polk, and he fully supported annexation, and um, he's going to win uh, because you know this idea of manifest destiny is really rampant. And if you weren't, if you were against manifest destiny, it's like you were an American. And Texas is annexed via joint resolution in February 18. 45, that means both houses of Congress have to approve the annexation of Texas and the are admitted into the country in December. But there's this um, boundary issue where Texas claimed the boundary of Texas was the Rio Grande River and Mexico claimed that Texas's claim, Texas's border should be the Nueces River. Um, and that's going to cause uh, the, the war to break out over this um, distinction between which river. Uh, James K. Polk is also going to seek to buy California from Mexico. Uh, Mexico refused. So it's only if they want to gain California, the only way to do it is via war. So you have something called the uh, Mexican-American War. And that is when... Uh, blood was shed on American soil and by the Spain, by the Mexicans. And uh, we don't know who shot first. Uh, we just know that blood was spilled and they urged Congress to declare war on um, Mexico. And then you have something called spot resolutions where they were given by former, fu former, future, future president. Abraham Lincoln, who get, was given the name Spotty Lincoln, because although, yes, blood was spilt on the land, uh, you need to see the spot where they actually um, blood was shed. So he was given the nickname Spotty Lincoln. 
Uh, and Henry David Thoreau writes his civil disobedience during this time of the Mexican-American War. Uh, Nicholas Triss was sent to negotiate the treaty with Mexico as uh, it was a quick, quick war um, where we invade Mexico and basically take control of Mexico City. So that's it's kind of the, the end of it. I mean, it was from 1846 to 1848. So Nicholas Triss goes down to uh, negotiate the treaty with Mexico. It's called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, and the U.S. paid Mexico $15 million for, for the war and for buying the Mexican session. Mexico ceded what is now the states of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, um, parts of Nevada, or all of Nevada, excuse me, uh, Utah, Colorado, all that land. So here's some parts of it. Uh, here's a dis dispute, disputed uh, land where Texas claimed the Nueces River right here. And the Rio Grande goes all the way down here. And so there were problems where, where was the official boundary? Okay, in this disputed green area is what they fought for. Okay, uh, this is Henry David Thoreau, as we saw last time with his neck beard. Uh, and this is Santa Ana, who becomes the leader of Mexico during the Mexican-American War. All right, so some sectional debate. Uh, you need to know the Wilma Proviso, although it did not pass, you need to know it. Uh, it was provided by David Wilmot, Democrat from Pennsylvania. And he wanted to introduce an amendment to a bill saying that slavery would not exist in any land gained, voice crack, gained from Mexico. It was passed in the House where more of the population was in the North, but it wasn't passed in the Senate. So it, the amendment didn't happen. But it, it's this idea that slavery will not exist um, in this new territory gained from Mexico. Um, and that's a big idea. All right. You have another thing. We talked about it last time, the Free Soil Party against the expansion of slavery in the new territories gained free soil, free labor, free men. Uh, and then you have the gold rush happening shortly after California is uh, given to the United States. And it really starts out in John Sutter's mills. And this is where, you know, the team across the bay gets their name. The San Francisco 49ers, 1849, is the gold rush where people, this uh, gold is discovered in California. And everyone who has the means to get to California came to California. And the population increased from 14,000 to 220,000 people in just four years. That is a, that is, I don't know what the percentage is, but that's over a hundred percent boom uh, in, in California. And they were mostly men, mostly men. So there are pictures. Um, that's uh, the chase guy that uh, actually leads the free soil party. Okay. And that's uh, Mr. Wilmot, Mr. Wilmot. All right, so sectional debate continues. Um, <clears throat> the fate of the newly acquired land, as long as they were territories, <clears throat> the federal government would decide the fate of slavery. You need to know this, personal liberty laws, and there are gonna be laws that are passed by Northern states that barred involvement in returning runaway slaves. You have this uh, compromise of 1850, big, big, big five-part compromise, okay? Popular sovereignty would be given to the people living in the Mexican session. That means the people who live there in the territories get to decide whether or not they're going to have slavery or they're going to be a free state. All right. California was immediately admitted as a free state into the union. Um, and this kind of takes away from, you know, the, the, Missouri Compromise, because that line was supposed to extend all the way out to the West Coast through the Mexican session. So, you know, hey, man. Um, now, free states have an advantage in the Senate. However, 
There was a more strict fugitive slave law, which is going to lead to more personal liberty laws in the North, which is going to cause more tension between the North and the South. You have slave trade. The slave trade, although the international slave trade was banned in, you know, 1808, uh, the internal slave trade was not. Um, but the slave trade was actually outlawed in the nation's capital in D.C. Uh, so, you know. And Texas was paid money to relinquish some land in their dispute so they could settle some debt. So uh, more compromise. Uh, it was the end of the Great Triumvirate, the, the three people that made that, uh, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and Daniel Webster. You have Daniel Webster's March, 7th of March speech in which he urged Congress to support the Fugitive Slave Act to avoid conflict. And that's just not going to end well. And you have the emergence of Stephen Douglas as a national leader, and you have the omnibus versus individual bills in Congress. <clears throat> and that's uh, Daniel Webster looking pretty mad. Okay, more crisis. As, as I just previously said, the North opposed the Fugitive Slave Act, so it's going to lead to them passing the personal liberty laws, which creates more tension between the North and the South. Franklin Pierce becomes president. Uh, you have this thing called Young America, where it's the expansion of U.S. democracy. Uh, and this would happen during his time, the Austin Manifesto. And there was a plan of Southerners to buy Cuba from Spain. And if they refused, the U.S. would take it by force. And there was this fear of making Cuba a slave state. Um, and that quickly uh, fizzled out. Um, it, it never happened. But just so you know, it that, those were the plans, okay? Much like the Wilmot Proviso, okay? The Offstand Manifesto is also important, okay? The Gadsden Purchase, um, it was the land left over. Uh, it's like the southern parts of Arizona and New Mexico. That little piece uh, was bought from Mexico. Um, Jimmy Fallon does a good Gadsden Purchase. Um, skit on a show, but it was bought by U.S. Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, who will become the future uh, Confederate States of America president, and it was bought for the Transcontinental Railroad. Here's the land from Yuma all the way to, basically, it's the southern parts of Arizona and New Mexico. Okay, more. Big, 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 big. Okay, uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, 1854, it was a response to the Gadsden Purchase, and the North wanted the railroad. Uh, and so they proposed popular sovereignty in no, the Nebraska Territory, which basically overturns the Missouri Compromise, makes it null and void, and presumably Kansas would become a slave state, and Nebraska would become a free state, and... Uh, this, it was never stated that way. It was just assumed. And so you have something that leads directly after this act, and that's bleeding Kansas, uh, where pro and anti-slavery people show up to in large numbers to vote. Now, remember, it's that popular sovereignty rule, you know, this free soil, and their people in the territories get to vote on it. Well, um, you have all these uh, outsiders moving into this area just so that they could vote to make it free or make it slave. Uh, you have the burning of Lawrence, Kansas in a free soil town burned to the ground. You have the caning of Charles Sumner. Uh, he was beaten by a South Carolina representative in the house. And then you have uh, the Potawatomi Creek incident massacre led by John Brown in response to Lawrence in the caning, it's just, it's just mayhem in Kansas. Uh, so again, free soilers, anti-slavery and the expansion of slavery in the territories, they believe slavery took away jobs from whites and it basically will help them morph into the new Republican party. Uh, and there's this idea of the slave power conspiracy where the South sought to expand slavery um, and it must be destroyed. So, and then we've already seen some of these, the pro-slavery arguments. 
uh, where slavery uh, was expanded because of rebellions and writings, you know, by, you know, Harry Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin. John C. Calhoun said it was a positive good, you know, um, George Fitzhugh defended it. Okay, there's religious justification that there's slavery in the Bible, so therefore it's okay. And then obviously the sense of superiority, whites over blacks. Um, yeah. Okay, President, uh, now President Buchanan gets elected in 1856, uh, and he did not vote on the Kansas Nebraska Act, so he was Kansas less. And immediately following his um, elections, the Panic of 1857, which is over what? Speculation. In this case, land speculation. Uh, King Cotton in the South, uh, they weren't that they weren't hit that hard, but still it was a panic. So you know, money. And uh, a, a famous, I don't know why this is, this needs to be um, italicized. Dred Scott versus Sanford, 1857. So Dred Scott. It was a horrible court case, by the way. Dred Scott was a slave that uh, was brought to live in Illinois and Wisconsin, which were free territories, free areas, free states. And because he lived there for a time, he thought he had earned his freedom because it's in a free state. So he's going to sue for his freedom. But the court's ruling, uh, Scott could not sue because he was not a citizen. He didn't even have the right to bring it to the court So, because he's not even a citizen, all right? Slaves were property and they could not be taken away without due process, which is in our Fifth Amendment. And now this big, another devastating blow to like all these new territories is Congress cannot eliminate slavery in the territories. What? Are you kidding me? It, it's it's kind of mind-boggling. Congress could not eliminate slavery in the territories. Congress does not have that power. Mm. That, was, that was Dred Scott. Okay, continuing on. The Lincoln-Douglas Lincoln -Douglas debates, basically kind of the form of you, what you see in debates nowadays. It stems from the way that they modeled their debates. And there are seven debates over the Senate seat in Illinois. Douglas would eventually win, but alienates the South in the process. And Lincoln would emerge on a national level. And by Douglas uh, alienating the South, it's only going to make Lincoln see as a better candidate. And then you have John Brown in Harper's Ferry incident in Virginia, where he hoped to incite a slave rebellion. They go in what is now today... Um, West Virginia, but it's still Virginia back then. And so they take over an arsenal and hoping to uh, start up a rebellion. Uh, and many Southerners felt that the North and Republican Party were filled with all these John Brown types. Then you have the election of 1860 that kind of starts the the Civil War uh, gears a churning when Lincoln won the uh, won the election without receiving a single electoral vote from the South. And that leads to secession. And of course, the first state that secedes is the naughty, naughty South Carolina. Um, and because they secede without, you know, without Lincoln receiving a vote from any Southern state, they felt that because the South wasn't represented in the election, they have the choice to, to leave the country. So that's what they do. All right, so not in your book, but you should know these. Uh, the Impending Crisis of the South, it's a book written by Hinton Helper, uh, where it also writes about the non-slave-owning whites were hurt as well in the South, not just, you know, the quarter of people that owned slaves. It was the other three quarters of non-slave-owning whites were also being hurt. And then you have this term called fire eaters, which were Southerners that would threaten secession in Congress, called fire eaters. All right. Uh, there we go. That's chapter 13, um, leading up to the Civil War. So, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Um, as always, if you did, make sure you smack that like button. And as always, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace!